Hi, I'm Ron Greiner. In 1989, I found myself divorced, something I didn't want and never thought would happen to me. As I turned to the Lord for grace, mercy, and forgiveness, over time, he did heal my heart. But I wondered if he would ever provide me a loving relationship again. I'm Marcia Greiner. I came to Chapel Rock in 1984 looking for a community of believers where I could worship apart from ties to my marriage, which was falling apart. Not long after, I became divorced and felt unworthy of God's grace and blessing in my life. But God was willing to write a love story for us in a much better way than we could imagine. We joined Christian Singles in Indianapolis. Now that was before online dating apps, so you younger people in the crowd will find this incredibly outdated and funny. <laughs> but we were given sheets of paper to fill out, an essay to write about ourselves, picture page, and some multiple choice questions to answer, and all these were put into a scrapbook. So then we physically had to drive to the location on the east side of Indy and look through these scrapbooks in order to find someone that we might date. I spent an hour and a half looking through all the scrapbooks of the men's profiles and selected only four. But I couldn't remember which was which. I walked across the room, flipped open a book, which just happened to land on his page, and just happened to be one of those four numbers. So I selected him as the choice. When I got the card in the mail, I went into Christian Singles, and I looked at her profile, and I said, yes, I would like to meet her. And so we got each other's contact information. On September 10th, 1993, we had our first date, and it wasn't long before we both knew this is the one. We like to think that God turned the pages of that scrapbook, and he did a much better job of giving us a spouse than we had done our first time. There was a popular worship song in the 90s which, <clears throat> with the words, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. I remember singing that song so alone as a single mom and wondering, would God ever make a way for me to find a loving relationship? But God did make a way for us. We were engaged in December and married in June of 1994. On June 4th, 2024, we will celebrate 30 years of marriage. <laughs> Thank you. Together, Together we have five children, 11 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. We like to think that God gave us a mate that was so much more compatible than we could have ever dreamed and complimented us in ways that we never thought of. Over the years, God has allowed us to minister together here at Chapel Rock in teaching high school Sunday school classes, college age classes, and in leading mission trips with you. And for the last 28 years, God has allowed us to minister together through Mission Indy, and what a joy it has been. We have experienced many other but God stories in our life that we don't have time to tell today. However, there is a current but God story that he hasn't finished yet. In 2019, I began to volunteer with Wayne Township Adult Education at the English Language Learners class in Brownsburg. I fell in love with the immigrants and refugees that I worked with in those classes, helping them to learn or improve their English skills. Fast forward to early 2023, and the survey that we did here at Chapel Rock showed that the number one thing our members have passion in, interest in, and skill in is education. Members expressed the idea that having education advanced in our community was a thing they were interested in, and we learned that there are over 75 languages represented in the homes of our children in the MSD Wayne and Speedway school systems. We also learned that all the area English classes were full with long waiting lists. So some of the Chapel Rock leadership and others got together and began to dream and wonder about starting an ELL program here at Chapel Rock 
with the, bless our neighbors with the opportunity to learn English right here. I was willing to lead this effort, but it seemed daunting. I have a passion for ELL and experience volunteering in a program, but what does a retired nurse know about starting an ELL program? But God. In May of 2023, Ron and I learned about FIAC, Faith International English Classes out of Faith Church at 91st and College. FIAC has been teaching English classes in their community since 2005. This kingdom-minded program has been so helpful in sharing their expertise and knowledge with us, and we became confident we can do this. In August 2023, a leadership team of seven people was formed, and the decision was made to name the program WELL, Westside English Language Learning. The amazing thing is, WELL is a completely volunteer program with no money. Sound impossible, but God. From the beginning, there's been a team praying for WELL, and our leadership team has regularly heard and seen God moving and making a way for WELL. He, he has provided an adult English a director and a children's director, as well as an experienced ESL teacher as a consultant, and tremendous teachers for each of our classes. God has provided most of the startup funding for WELL, and many of you, as well as people in our community, have expressed interest in helping to volunteer with WELL. And we have no doubt that God will supply the English students for well. We have been praying Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 over well as we prepare to launch in August of 2024. Verses 20 and 21 read, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him and in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So glad to be with you this morning. Whoa, there we go. Um, my name is Nick Wilkes. If we haven't had an opportunity to meet, I work with the middle school and high school students, have that, uh, that honor, that privilege um, here uh, week in and week out, and just love the joy of being able to serve uh, with you all as part of the body here at Chapel Rock. I'm um, excited to continue in this series, our But God series this morning, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we get started. So if you have your Bibles uh, or Bible app, if you could uh, go ahead and make that ready. And we're going to start by reading a pretty good chunk of Scripture that is going to help us just kind of hear uh, some of the background and even embedded in that text, um, the heart of our But God story uh, today. So um, let's hear from the word of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. It says this, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of, of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe." Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not 
to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. As we begin, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, our prayer is that we would know your power, that we would know you more, Jesus, that we would come to know and experience your Holy Spirit's undeniable power working in and through us. Lord, help us today. We, we ask and pray that you would help us by um, giving us a better understanding of your word, by, by, by also grasping and, and helping us to live out the way of the cross that you marked out for us. Teach us, Lord. Lead us. Fill us. We pray that you'd move us now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. When you hear the word weakness, I wonder what comes to mind. You think back to maybe a time in your past, you know, growing up. Maybe it, was, maybe it was a time long ago, or maybe not so long ago, where you were picked last for the team. I've been in that place before. Or maybe, maybe you feel like in your weakness you, you're not measuring up to the strength of other folks that are surrounding you, other people that might seem stronger. Um, does weakness in your mind maybe get associated with um, experiences that you've had of suffering? maybe of difficult seasons that you've been through? Does the word weakness bring up feelings of loss that you wish were wins? I understand there's been a little tournament basketball going on, you know, this past month. Maybe, maybe weakness to you means, ah, your team that you wanted to go all the way, just, ah, they were, they were almost there, but, but didn't quite finish it out the way that you want. Does weakness make you think of inadequacies or things that you wish were different. We're going to wrestle with this theme today, this, this idea of, of strength and weakness and wisdom and foolishness. But, you know, as we start with, with strength and weakness, it can be kind of a tough thing to wrestle to the ground, especially in our cultural context where power, strength, as Paul alluded to just a few moments ago, poise, charisma, are so highly valued. Not that those things in and of themselves are bad, but they can't stand alone without a foundation underneath, a, a foundation of character, a foundation of integrity, a foundation of honesty. And, and we can all think of the tragedy of, of what sometimes happens and what we've seen in sometimes very public downfalls where an individual's charisma outpaces their character and, and the fallout from that. And whether it's on the national stage or whether it's on the neighborhood stage or whether it's on the personal stage, that we walk across each day. Um, sometimes it can be telling of what a culture values when we think about what we put on top as things of primary importance. Is it, is it strength? Is it power? Some of these, these different things. This past Sunday night, we're having a, a great conversation with the middle school students, as we always do on Sunday nights. And uh, we were talking about this very idea of, of priorities. I see some middle schoolers in the room right here. And we were talking about how, um, you know, a lot of times what, what can be really telling of what our personal priorities are is when we look at our schedule, the way we put together uh, the time that we have at our discretion throughout a normal day or throughout a normal week. You look at someone's schedule, you can see a little bit of a window into what their priorities are. Now, for a middle school student, you know, I mean, sleep is like right up there, you know, pretty high, right? <clears throat> you know, for all of us, maybe that is, you know, but then come some things that, you know, we have no choice in the matter over, right? School, you know, that's a big chunk of it. Homework, another big chunk of it. We got to eat, you know, we got to get ready. 
uh, maybe some chores, maybe some reading, maybe a a little video games after school, maybe some adventure, maybe some exercise. Um, So, you know, some of those things are dictated for you, but the older you get, you know, it's like, okay, let's let's take a look at our our daily schedule. Let's take a look at our weekly schedule and what might that look like. That can be a little bit telling, you know, of of where our priorities are. Uh, And it can be similar when it comes to, you know, taking a look, maybe holding up a mirror as this passage did for the Corinthian church, and I think will for us too, to go like, okay, as, as we look at ourselves and the things that we value in other people, or the things that we strive after, like what are our priorities and where do they come from? You know, what, what's, what's at the root of those, those things? Um, it's not anything new. In fact, the, the heart of this passage that we're looking at today is, is, as I mentioned, the Apostle Paul holding up a mirror for the church at Corinth to help them see some things that really matter. And, and the word from 1 Corinthians 1 that we just read, I, I, th- I think it really cuts across the grain of a cultural moment that we're in, as it did for Paul in his day. It kind of pulls back that curtain to get us to think deeply about what's, in, what's most important and, and challenges us to think about uh, what's at the heart of our very lives, what we prioritize, the way we carry ourselves. So uh, we're going to look at value that he sees and that he talks about in what some would consider weakness. We're going to see some pretty cool places that God is at work in what sometimes seems like foolishness outside of Christ. We're going to look at ways that God shows up in the lives of the lowly um, that sometimes uh, maybe if we're not searching for those, we, we might miss. But here's, a, here's another question that I want us to really chew on today um, as we uh, think about this text. Could it be that God actually has more need of our weakness than our strength? What would that look like? I want, I want to kind of push pause on the 1 Corinthians 1 passage for a second and jump to Paul's second letter. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and I want to read a couple of verses to you from that that I think helps you to see another way where this was, this was personal for Paul. For Paul. Like there was, there was a but God story happening in him where he had gone through some, some really humbling experiences and was still currently going through some. We're going to read that here in just a second. But it was, it was, a, it was on a personal sort of a level. Um, the surrounding context in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where I'm going to read in just a second, is this passage that maybe you've known about or maybe you've heard about where he talks about his thorn in the flesh. And sometimes we even use that kind of as a mo- metaphor, right? It's like, ah, it's just my thorn in the flesh, you know? It's just a, but it, co- it comes from Paul wrestling and praying for, uh, Scripture talks about in 2 Corinthians 12, three times he pleaded for the Lord to say, take away something that was, that was incredibly difficult that he was dealing with. And we, it's never really named specifically, and I kind of like that, you know, because we kind of, you know, sometimes we can kind of imagine, you know, what that might be. Um, but for Paul, uh, he comes to the place where he, he hears from God speaking into his very life in that moment. And that's, that's the way 2 Corinthians 12, 9 starts out, something that God specifically says to him. But I, I want you to think about this before I read it. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's one thing to know about God. It's one thing to kind of get some facts right in our head or, you know, kind of, you know, we, we study through that passage, but it's, it's another thing to, to know God through that, to know, like, wh- what does this mean for the way that I'm going to live this out? What does this mean for, for not just taking other people at his word, but really listening to him, really, really wrestling with what is the Spirit saying to me in this moment? And Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, on the heels of the fact that he'd been praying for God to take away this, this uh, thorn in his flesh, but he hadn't, uh, he, he says this, but he said to me. So you're, you're getting a window and just like to the intimacy of, you know, a very tender moment. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. What? In insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So 
I mean, how does he find not only true strength, true strength in what could be perceived as weakness, this, this thorn that was, that was still there, but more so, how could he come to the place where he says he even delights in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties? Oftentimes, those are the things we're running away from, things we don't want any part of. But, but he's come to the place where not only is he, has he found a power that's, that's revealing something way more amazing than he could possibly imagine in that moment, uh, but he's looking forward to what God will continue to do through those difficult things. How could God possibly have more need of his weakness there than his strength? And how might he be able to work in, in ways beyond what we can possibly imagine? That's what, we're gonna, that's what we're wrestling with. That's the heart of this today in this but God story. Um, and his, his life, the Apostle Paul's life, is the means through which he's making this illustration here in 2 Corinthians 12. But really what's at the heart behind why what is perceived as weakness is a better way forward than human power alone is power that's rooted in the way of Jesus. I mean, I love, uh, Paul, what you, what you talked about from, uh, from Philippians chapter 2 and this idea that, you know, we, we follow after Jesus who uh, put on display the path that's marked out for us to follow. And, and Paul found that his weakness would often provide a platform for the Lord's power to be put on display. That is good news for ordinary people like me and like you who know weakness, right? That's, that's good news to know. The end is not just the strength that I can muster up on my own, but I, I want to look a little deeper at some of the language that's being used here because I, I think it, it gives us a little bit of an insight. Um, there's, there's a Greek word, teleo, which is used, um, and it's translated in the NIV as the word perfect. So in, in first, or 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where it says, a power is made perfect, that's the word teleo. Um, it can be translated perfect, but uh, you can see that it also can be translated as something that comes to its end, something that's reached the goal, something that's, that's come to completion. Um, and so the NIV translates this, that my power is made perfect, but still, when you, when you read that, it's a little bit ambiguous about, okay, you say, my power, is this, is this God's power? Is this Paul's power? Like, whose power are we talking about here? And it's a little ambiguous here because there's actually no pronoun to tie it to Paul or God um, in the Greek. It's, it's, just, it's just the word, the, the word power along with the word that's being perfected um, is... Is, has no pronoun. So interpreters are really left to kind of dig, with, dig into whether it's God's power that's being perfected or it's Paul's power that's coming to an end. So just hang with me for just a second. Um, the NASB kind of, and it's kind of known for just being a little bit more of a literal translation that's just not making that interpretation for you, but uh, it translates like this. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. So you don't really know. You're just like, okay. Um, but, but think about this. If it's God's power that's perfected in weakness, as it's often read, then we understand with Paul how his weakness, how his difficulties, how his hardship can indeed provide a platform for God's perfect power to be put on display in incredible ways. Man, how comforting is that? If, however, on the opposite side or on, on, on a different facet, um, it's interpreted as Paul's power, I think it's, it still gives us unique insight in here because if it's Paul pow Paul's power that comes to an end in its weakness, we see another dimension to the story. Because when we're at the end of our own power in a moment where we might consider, you know, very clearly that we're weak, but we're at the end of our power, it's awesome that God finally has room to make himself known. You know, we know this in the moments of our life where maybe things are good, we've been cruising along, and sometimes there's a little bit of that temptation when everything's good to just kind of relax a little bit, especially when it, when it comes to maybe um, the disciplines that, that we know should be a part of our everyday life. Um, the things that we pray for in good times, or the things that we um, we go after, you know, might be a little bit different than the moments when the bottom drops out. And you know those moments where it's just like, uh-oh, 
I, I don't know what to do here. I got nothing in this moment. Maybe a moment where we, th- we feel like we've tried to control all the things that we can control, but we got nothing else we can control. You know, and it is, it is a moment of weakness, um, and, and we grasp sometimes. We, we seek, and, and, and I wonder, what do our prayers look like then? You know, what, what, what does it sound like when our power has come to an end? Physically, you know, many of us are used to sayings like, um, kind of, I don't know if it came from Paul's dad, but, you know, maybe it did. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you what? Stronger, right? You know, yeah. You know, things like that where we're just like, what? You know, it's, it's almost like bred into us, you know, in, in the culture that we've, we've grown up in where it's like, well, you know, uh, we're used to bootstrapping it. You know, I like the outdoorsy version of that. I, I saw it on a t-shirt once. Said, it said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger except for bears. <laughs> bears will kill you, you know. <clears throat> you know, um, but, you know, what if true strength isn't just found in, you know, well, it didn't kill me, it's going to make me stronger, I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. But, but what if st- true strength is found in truly being surrendered to a power that's greater than our own? That's what, that's what Paul's getting at. That's one of the greatest aha moments of, of his life in, in, in this passage in 2 Corinthians, um, especially in the midst of suffering. And, and, and for those that are suffering, for those that are walking through a difficult spot, man, this is, this is great news. And, and it's because of the message of the cross that on the one hand can seem like foolishness to those who are perishing, those that are trying to go at it alone, but to those that recognize that they're not saved by their own strength, Paul says, it is the power of God. Francis Finland once said, uh, let us commence to walk the road which Jesus walked for us since it's the only one which can lead us to him. I really like that quote because, you know, uh, even though Jesus walked this path, it's a, it's a good reminder to go, yep, uh, it's the way of the cross. When, when he calls us to follow after him, you know, the strength and power that's found in following after him is following uh, in the way of the cross. He modeled it. He lived it uh, in a way of humility, in a way of total dependence on the Father, in a way of love, in a way of compassion, in a way of suffering that led to a cross, which ultimately disarmed the principalities and powers who were living according to a different way. We see it in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who know that they're empty without him. He's talking about that. That's when we're ready to receive, when we know we're empty without him. We see it in the way that Jesus put children front and center. Any kids in the room today? Yeah, yeah. Jesus front and center, this idea of Mark chapter 10, verses 14 through 15 says, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never, in, never enter into it. I mean, that's upside down. That's, that's the opposite of the way that the world sees power and prestige and, and strength. Jesus puts on display a child in our midst. Uh, we see it in the way uh, that, that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Philippians chapter 2, which we've, we've already had a hint of this morning in our communion time, talks about um, his humble, total obedience, even to death. So that's, that's, that's foundational, but back to this passage in 1 Corinthians, that we, the, big, the big section of text that we read as we started out. Um, in, in this but God story today, Paul's trying to help the Corinthian church uh, simply walk the road that Jesus walked for us. And, and he's showing, we've, we've seen in other places in, in his other letter, how he himself wrestled through this, and he's, he's putting on display the way that's made forward for him uh, by Jesus. Um, it's Paul's power at its end, but it's God's power perfected 
in weakness. So then, it, he, back to 1 Corinthians, um, he challenges them to take a look at their own story, to go, okay, you know, how do, how do we fit into this? He, ma- he makes it personal for them. And so let's, let's make it personal. As we dig into the text, just as Paul did for the church, back to 1 Corinthians 1, 26, he challenges them to think about where they came from. Where are you in the story? So 126 says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. So just to review, how many were wise? Not many. How many were influential? Not many. How many came from prominent or noble backgrounds? Not many. But God. God acts here. He acts in this passage in a powerful way in the lives of people to choose them to choose to use them and their story. Everyday, ordinary kind of folks, but in verses 27 and 28, as as we read here in a second, um, three times God chooses something that might seem a little bit different, a little bit unordinary when it comes to worldly priorities. Verse 27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So let's take a little closer look at the foolish, at the weak, at the lowly. And, and think about what the difference is between just knowing about this truth, just, just, just knowing that it exists, and, and knowing God in a way that we're, we're living out the power that is available for us. So when, the verse, when verse 27 says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, we got we to gotta remember, we got to think back to verse 25. Turn back to 25, look back to verse 25. It says, it says this, why, why did God choose... the the foolish things to shame the wise? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. The best that we can come up with pales in comparison. The powers that be in Jesus' day thought that they had dealt with Jesus, right? They thought they had a plan. They thought they had it all figured out. Those that were threatened by Jesus in his day thought that the cross would be the end of what Jesus was up to. But God... Little did they know that it was through the cross that God's wisdom would actually be put on display uh, in a way that would set the captives free forever. And likewise for us, Matthew chapter 16, we get a sense of the cost of what it means to to take hold of this ultimate upside-down wisdom. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, He must deny himself. He must take up his cross. He must follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, that's where we find it. By following Jesus and taking up our cross as well, what looks like a path of foolishness is actually where we find life. You know, why is it that some of, you know, the most life-giving things that, that we find in life have to do with sacrifice? I think it's, it's because of this very, it's this very idea. When we find we're following after the way of the cross, it's, it's a moment where, where we hear people say or we've said to, a, to, to other people before, you know, I came to serve and be a blessing, but I found in return that, man, it was, it was such more, way more of a blessing to me to be able to do whatever you're doing, whether that's on a mission trip, whether that's, you know, weekly outreach or having a conversation with a friend or, you know, connecting with someone, uh, offering radical hospitality to someone. You know, parents know this. 
on behalf of your kids. Students know this when they've uh, served on a mission trip and sacrificed to give a week at Mission Indy or to, to give a week um, uh, in Mexico. Um, we see this time and time again when we join in the power of taking up this sacrificial way of the cross, that's when we find life. That's when what may seem like foolishness to some, to others, is literally the power of God put on display. So God chose what often seems foolish to show the wise something that can't be seen without Jesus. That's the first thing. But God also chose the weak to shame the strong. Kind of interesting. But we remember, back to verse 25, 1 Corinthians 1.25, that's because the weakness of God is stronger than human strength, any human strength we could muster up. And what God is doing with foolishness and wisdom as it relates to the cross is also what he's doing through that same perspective when it comes to strength and weakness. As, as Jesus endured what he endured on our behalf, what could seem on the surface like weakness? Why is he doing that? Why is he submitting? Why is he surrendered? Uh, we see the ultimate strength in his victory over sin and death. Uh, there's, there's a quote that uh, is, has really been um, weighing on me as it comes to thinking about you know, put myself in this perspective from a guy named John, uh, Johan, sorry, Johan Christoph Arnold. Um, uh, I'm familiar with the quote, not his name as much. Uh, but uh, he says this, the more confidence we have in our own strength and abilities, the less we are likely to have in Christ. You ever been in that place? But he says, our human weakness is no hindrance to God. In fact, as long as we do not use it as an excuse for sin, it's good to be weak. But this acceptance of weakness is more than just acknowledging our limitations. It means experiencing a power that's much greater than our own and surrendering to it. And then he quotes Ebert Arnold, who is founder of the, the Bruderhof mo movement. And, and, and Ebert says this, this is the root of grace, the dismantling of power. Whenever a little power rises up in us, the spirit and authority of God will retreat to the corresponding degree. And in my estimation, this is the single most important insight with regard to the kingdom of God. Man, he was, he was wrestling with this through, through an intentional community and still the Bruderhof movement is a, is a worldwide um, pretty awesome thing that uh, folks that are surrendered uh, to the Lord are, are, are living out, you know, not just in practice, not in theory, but in practice. Uh, but, he's, but he's talking about this idea that whenever a little power rises up in us, man, it's a, little, it's a little temptation there. You know, sometimes that squeezes out the spirit and authority of God, um, and, and we don't want to be in that place. <clears throat> you know, how often have you heard someone say, man, I tried everything I could possibly think of, and then when I finally gave up, you know, that's when the fruit happened. You know, you've, you've, heard, you've heard people say that. Maybe you've, you've said that your, yourself. You know, I've personally heard it when it comes to someone uh, struggling in their, in their walk. You know, even coming to a place where it's like taking a hold of Jesus for the first time as Lord and Savior. It's like, man, I tried everything. You know, I wrestled everything to the ground. But when I finally gave up, that's when I found life. You know, I've heard it, uh, you've heard it uh, with folks that have, uh, man, maybe had a, a career change and they've been in a difficult time in their family or it's like uncertainty is like, you know, front and center. And it's like, man, I tried everything. But when I finally gave up, man, I found God's faithfulness in the midst of that. I've seen it in couples struggling with infertility. You know, it's like, finally gave up. And maybe God provided a, a child, maybe provided uh, through adoption, maybe provided in a way that, you know, just helped reconcile just the, the, the pain that they were feeling. I've heard it in, in, in former student hitting rock bottom, wrestling through a deep place of substance abuse. Yeah, man, I tried everything. But when I finally gave up, when I finally reach that place, you know, to come to the place where we finally realize that God's, even God's weakness is stronger than our strength, 
any strength we could possibly muster up and to surrender, to make room for his strength in our life. It's such a wonderful thing. It's such a mysterious part of the way in which the gospel is at work in our lives. It's as tangible as the everyday stories of countless people that you and I have heard time and time again say, when I finally came to the end of myself, to the end of what I thought I could do, to the end of my money, to the end of my resources, to the end of the very last idea that I had, to the end of my own uh, solo effort and power, that's when I found God at work most powerfully. Or maybe it's that's when I finally got out of the way enough to make room for God's power to be perfected. So God chose the weak to shame the strong because even the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And finally, God chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify, to invalidate the things that are. We read that in 1 Corinthians 1.28. And I, I want you to think about this. What kind of examples, we, we read a few earlier about uh, just the way the kingdom works, but what kind of other examples did Jesus continually put on display when it comes to God working through the lowly. Sometimes the things that folks might consider to be despised or things that, that are not. What about a mustard seed? Remember Jesus talking about that in Matthew chapter 13? A mustard seed's tiny, so small. Some of the most seemingly insignificant, you know, start of a plant, yet... You know, the but God, but, but it grows to become one of the largest of garden plants. Jesus said, you know what, uh, this, this idea of the way that I work, let's check out this mustard seed. Matthew chapter 13 also talks about a little bit of yeast working through the whole batch of dough. See a few bakers out here. You know. What about the example of being sent out like sheep among wolves? It's kind of a heavy one. Matthew chapter 10 talks about that. You know, certainly that's an upside down perspective when you think about the model that we follow after in his strength and power is a sheep. And not only is that the model to follow after him as a sheep, but you're sent out among the wolves. Now, how's that going to work? Unless it's through strength and power that's not our own. There's a time recorded in Matthew chapter 1 where Jesus is teaching the religious leaders, you know, uh, folks that were, you know, felt like they were you know, trying to, to figure out what he was doing, but sometimes missing what he was saying. And Matthew chapter 21, 31 records Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, man, some of the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. It was, it was a perspective. It was, it was holding up the mirror to say, man, what are you, what are you prioritizing here? What do, you, what do you think is most important? Because it, the, the, it is open and available to anyone that would take a hold of this, this power that he wanted to be at work uh, in them. God started through a Jewish teenager to birth uh, his son. Mary, her blue-collar carpenter fiance, and his very lineage in, includes some folks of ill repute, you might say. A lot of unlikely characters, but we see time and time again in Scripture how sometimes when we're tempted to look at the outward appearance, it's the Lord is, is looking at the heart. He's at work in a deeper way than maybe we can sometimes see as we just look at, on the surface. And I love the way we see this come alive in our stories as well. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. What does his calling look like in your story? He says to the Corinthian church, Paul says, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. And not many of us are. But thank God that his power is perfected. His power uh, is, is on display even in the midst of our weakness. And it's not about who we are as we come to him, but it's about whose we are as we put our trust in him. 
as we join up to be part of what he wants to do in and through us. So how do we live it out? What do we do with it? How do we move from knowing about it to knowing God and his power to help us live, live it out? Um, Marva Dawn, uh, I've really appreciated a book that I've kind of been studying alongside this called Powers, Weakness, and the Tabernacling of God. But in that book, there's a quote that says this, the cross is as necessary for those who wish to serve the church as our food and water are for the maintenance of the body. Now, what does that look like to live that out this afternoon, today, in the midst of the situations that we face where we're following after the pattern that Jesus lays out for us, the cross is as necessary for us as lunch is, um, that our stomachs are telling us about right now. Here's a couple of things I do know. In the midst of, of trusting God in that, our weakness, it's no hindrance to God. None whatsoever. When we give up on our own power, we finally have room for God's power to be put on display in our life. So what do we do? What's next? Here's a couple ideas, just a few, three. Number one, application. How do we live it out? Be humble. Stay humble. Paul had the equivalent, really, if you think about it, he says he came in, in humility, fear, much trembling. He had the equivalent of a couple of like PhDs in, you know, his Jewish studies, you know, b uh, even before he came to Christ when he was persecuting the church. Yet for him, as he came to the church at Corinth, it wasn't about technique. It wasn't about accolades. It wasn't about persona. Certainly his past would have humbled him in a big way. And he had learned a lot from that, that he had to lay down in humility. But as he came, he wanted nothing more than, than, than his presence, the way that he entered in to be about the Holy Spirit's leading for him and God's power on display, not his own. Oswald Sanders says, it's much easier to do something than to trust in God. We often mistake panic for inspiration. Ever been there? It's like, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just do something. But, but what does it look like? It, it takes humility to wait. It takes humility to trust. It takes humility to seek to know God rather than just to, to act in our own strength, maybe muster up a little bit of our own power, our own wisdom, because you know, we think we just got to get something done. But what does it look like to be humble, uh, to receive before we do? Another quote from Tim Savage um, in a book called uh, In Power Through Weakness. And he says this, those who enjoyed the most dramatic manifestations of divine power in scripture were often those of the greatest humility. You ever thought about that? This idea that we, we desire more than anything for God, make yourself known in, in, in a powerful way. And as we pray that, that's the dangerous kind of a prayer because uh, it, it it, it requires, it requires humility. Think about Abraham, Moses, Gideon, David. You know, God, God was near to them in, in their, their, their lowly moments. He was near to them when they were brokenhearted. He was near when they were crushed. He was near when they were humble. I love this verse in Isaiah 57, 15 sa that says, For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who's contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You might feel like your current situation today is, is less than ideal. It's less than what you imagine because maybe you're feeling lowly in spirit or brokenhearted, but Isaiah says, he declares the truth of the fact that that's where God moves in. That's where he sets up his tent. That's, where, that's, that's the place that he dwells as, as we're humble before him. 
Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Be humble. Live humbly. Because living humbly is living near to the heart of the Lord. It's moving into his neighborhood. And he's good. Second thing is this. Don't be quick to turn away from suffering. Think about Paul's story. You know, he'd been through a lot. He'd, he'd prayed for God to sh- change the circumstances, even when he felt like, ah, Lord, are you sure this is compatible with your goodness? I mean, I've got better ideas about how this story can play out. Yet, as he surrendered, uh, he continued to resolve to know nothing but Jesus and his crucifixion. Um, to know what it's like to, to walk that path that Jesus walked before us on our behalf. You know, suffering can often be about perspective. Have you ever noticed how there can be certain situations for some folks that um, it's, it's the exact same situation, but someone is like super miserable and some, uh, another person in that same exact situation is having the time of their life. You ever notice that, how that can happen? Um, hiking brings that to mind uh, for some people. I see some of you in this room that I've hiked some trails with that... <clears throat> Maybe uh, one or other of us have been in either of those uh, ends of that spectrum in a moment. But, you know, I think about that a lot in, in suffering. Every year, we have an opportunity to take our graduates on uh, a graduate trip, our senior trip. We hit a couple of national parks out in the great American West. One of them's uh, Grand Teton National Park. And uh, there's this hike that we do that's kind of like, it's, it's kind of what we lead up to. And it's grueling. It's, it's a beast of a hike. It's 14 miles round trip in one day. How many of you in this room, just out of curiosity, have hiked that, that trip? Yeah, yeah. Cascade Canyon. Uh, yeah, some of you have been on that trip. Some of you were on the Rob Fire Memorial trip back in, back in the day. It's, it's beautiful. It's thousands of feet of elevation gain. One of the most beautiful trails, like, in, in the entire country, I would contend. Um, but the, even though it's grueling, I, I would tell you that uh, there are some difficult moments on the trail, but um, the hundreds of people that we've taken on that hike know now, I hope they would say, that the reward at the top is definitely worth the struggle in the valley. And if that hike has taught me anything through the years, it's, it's that the struggle and suffering in the valley, it's oftentimes just as beautiful as the view from the top. Because the Lord's with you in the midst of the valley. So I ask you, you know, where might the Lord be leading you right now? Like application time, you know, from 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 this moment on, as we leave this room, what are the, the places, the spaces right now uh, where you might be in a very real valley, but you need his wisdom, his power, his strength to be put on display. Uh, in, in a real tangible way. The struggle's real, but what's also real is what's available from the Lord in the midst of whatever personal value you might be facing right now. So be humble. Don't be quick to turn away from suffering. And finally, rely on God's power. Yes, that was like the heart of it for the Apostle Paul. I was like, you know, where, what he was driving home to. Not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of, of the Spirit's power. We're reminded of that in other places in Scripture. And John John chapter 15 is one, you know, I I wrestle with a lot, you know, staying in that place in John chapter 15 where, where Jesus says to remain in Him and He in us. And when we do that, we bear much fruit. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. But it's that continual reminder that when we rely on God's power, His work it's his work in and through us that bears much fruit. And I love the story that Ron and Marsha shared uh, this morning. I love all of these but God testimonies that we've had. Real people, just real life situations. You know, sometimes circumstances that, you know, you might be, wow, wow. I, I, I didn't think about how God might show up, you know, in the midst of that and reveal himself in such a powerful way, but he has and he does and he will continue to do that. So what might it look like for us to hold on to him more than we ever have before? Maybe to take hold of him for the first time today. What would it look like to trust him 
to do what he says he's going to do in his word. In doing so, we make room for a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power on display in and through a life surrendered to him. You know, and while Paul helped the Corinthian believers really see God's work in and through their own lives, he brought it back to the personal. You know, and I, I want to wrap with a, a verse that was part of the verses we started with, uh, 1, Corinthians, or, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, where Paul wasn't saying, okay, so, so do as I say, not as I do. It wasn't one of those things, parents, sometimes. <clears throat> but he was saying, uh, let's do this together. Like, this, is, this is my story. This is, this is the only thing I know. He was commenting on their real life lived experience, but he was also commenting on him, on his. So don't miss what's at the heart of it all for him as, as we read this one last time. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, and I came to you. I didn't come with eloquence. I didn't come with human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, great fear, trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And can you imagine, church, if we lived our lives like that? Something we say at the end of service, we're going to say it in a few minutes. <clears throat> we bring our brokenness to Jesus because a change to wholeness is the story we share. What if, what if weakness wasn't seen as something that we were afraid of, but a truly a platform for God's glory to be put on display? What if bringing our brokenness to Jesus didn't, didn't make us a little bit intimidated because we might have to be vulnerable or we might have to share some things that have been uncomfortable, but, but truly, what if it was an opportunity for, for God to be at work in the most powerful way that only he can work in our lives? I'll tell you, I think it would look like some of the most difficult, seemingly impossible, sometimes hopeless, sometimes weak, sometimes end of our rope, down and out, give up, done sort of moments where God steps in and restores, where He renews, where He heals where lives are made whole. Not by or through our own power, not through our own wisdom, not through our own eloquence, but through the power of the Holy Spirit who declares my grace. It's sufficient by the power of Jesus alive and working in our midst. So may each of us May we be carried by Jesus, following after him, marked not by our own wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that our faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Let's pray. Holy Spirit. move in our midst. We need you to show up in big ways and small ways and in the places where we know you promised to work. Just help us, help us to trust you in the waiting. Help us to trust you in the valley. Help us to trust you in the seemingly impossible where we're at the end of our own strength or wisdom. God, work in a way that only you can. In the places that we so desperately need your presence. God, help us as, 
as we respond now, in this moment, as we respond in, in ways that we live our lives as we go from this place, as, as we live as, as your people. God, may the glory and honor be yours because uh, you use whatever we have uh, as a platform to, to put yourself on display. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to as we often do, uh, sing a song to, to close our service, but also to offer an invitation. And invitation's always open, but um, it might be an opportunity for you today if you would like to pray with somebody about maybe a next step that uh, Spirit's working on you to, to take. Uh, maybe it's, it's a moment of surrender. Maybe like Paul, it's, it's finally laying down something that the Lord's been working on you for a long time, and you just you just need to lay it down before the Lord and walk forward in a different way. Maybe it's taking a hold of, of Jesus for the first time today. Maybe it's making room in your heart for more of him and less of you. Uh, whatever it is, uh, wherever you might need to respond today or even just where you're at, uh, I pray that you would do so. Uh, let's stand together. Uh, let's have an opportunity to worship and um, we'll respond together.